And there were two young fish who were swimming. And as they were swimming, they encountered an older fish. The older fish greeted the two younger fish, and he said, morning, boys, how's the water? And the two younger fish kept swimming. And then a few minutes later, one of the younger fish turns to the other, and he goes, what the hell is water? So we might say that culture is like water. It is so ubiquitous that we might not even see it, much the way these two fish did not see it. And yet the culture that surrounds us influences our behaviors in ways that we might not ever imagine. And so while we often hear the expression that we are creatures of habit, I wonder, in fact, if we are more creatures of culture. And so if we really want to begin to change behaviors and help to improve the health and well-being of every employee in every organization, we might do better if we focus less on the fish, if you will, and more on the water that surrounds them. So we all know that getting more movement is a really good idea. We also know it's a really good idea to eat healthy and to quit smoking. And in fact, if we were to do just these three simple behaviors, simple behaviors, we could single-handedly prevent up to between 70 to 90% of the major chronic diseases. Uh, we know this, and yet most people don't do it. And in fact, this is what our work largely comes down to. I was going to get up early to go for a run this morning, but my toes voted against me 10 to 1. This is the knowing and doing gap. People know what to do, but they don't do it. So case in point, I used to be a personal trainer. And I am not kidding you, every single social event that I went to, somebody would find out that I was a personal trainer, and they'd be like, whoa, you're a personal trainer. How do I lose weight? And I would say, well, you want to eat healthier and you want to get more activity. And they'd be like, I know that. <laughs> so the question is, how do we start to dig at that knowing and doing gap? We often hear the expression that knowledge is power, and yet you'd be hard-pressed to find any smoker who doesn't know that smoking is bad for them, or anyone who doesn't know that it's a good idea to eat more broccoli, or anyone who doesn't know that it's a good idea to get more physical activity, and yet it's so hard for all of us to be able to close the knowing and doing gap. So the good news is that each of us, each of us, can do something about this knowing and doing gap. Each of us can go back to our organizations and we can build workplace wellness that works. And the good news is that every single person here, you can start a movement and in fact you already have. You already have unbelievable engagement rates of 95%. I'm so excited to hear that. Um, so you all are already on your way. But let's talk about how you can start to address the culture so that you can start to change these behaviors even more. So the first step is to uncover the hidden factors. You want to go back and you want to take a look at your culture. Is your culture one in which people are able to become their better selves? Or is it one in which people are becoming anything but? Are they overworked? Are they exhausted? So, so let me show you what this looks like. One of the organizations that we worked with before we began working with them, they were nice enough to share their uh, results on a, a survey that they had conducted. So they asked the question, did you participate in wellness, in our wellness program? So this seems like a reasonable question. And as you can see here, um, this is not in the state of Rhode Island because you can see that most people did not participate. Now question number two, they asked, if you did not participate, why not? Again, a reasonable question. This is a true story. Here were some of the responses that came back. Coworkers took the fun out of it. <laughs> this is a workplace of manipulative conniving units run by a power group of insiders. In all caps, I do not want to work out with employees at work. Uh, only with family and friends, or I am too exhausted to even be attending. 
This is not a workplace wellness strategy issue. This is a culture issue. And in the words of Peter Drucker, we know that culture eats strategy for breakfast. So you can have the best wellness strategy program in the world, but if you don't have a culture that supports it, you're gonna have a tough time getting that off the ground. So you must uncover the hidden factors first. So how do you begin to assess the culture? There's lots of ways that you can do it, but one of my favorite ways to do, that, to do this is to use images. Think about the average employee in your organization. If you were to show that employee these images here and ask them to select the one that best captures their day-to-day -day experience, which one would they pick? <laughs> Honestly. Think about that. If they are picking the one on the bottom left, you got a tough road ahead of you. <laughs> but it's important to know that, is it not? What are you, what are you, what's the larger culture that you're working with here? So we first have to look at that. So the next step is to then activate your leaders, especially your managers. So here we've got Crockett Dale here, CEO of Hellstat, and as you can see, he is doing his awesome power pose. Uh, he is an activated leader, which is terrific, but actually what seems to matter more, what the research suggests, is that managers may matter even more. So managers, the research shows, account for up to 70% of the variance of their team members' engagement with both their work as well as wellness. Managers have a choice to make. They can choose to put their head in the sand and pretend like this wellness stuff doesn't matter, or they can put on their cape and they can become that agent of change. They have a choice to make. Am I going to act as a multiplier or as a gatekeeper? They can become a manager on the move which is the primary thing that we are now doing in our work. Is our mission now is to activate every single manager in every single organization in this country to become a manager on the move. So how does a manager become a manager on the move? Three simple things, are we ready? Do. This is what I like to call, I want to see my boss in spandex phenomenon. <laughs> or maybe not. But the point is, is that, <laughs> or maybe not. I know everybody's starting to get really nervous, like, oh. But the point is, is that people want to see their direct supervisor or boss actually in there with them doing it. It's not enough for them to talk about it. They need to be in there leading by example. The next is that every manager needs to speak, to think about engaging their team members in well-being literally one conversation at a time. So it's one thing to get an email blast from HR. It's another thing to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with your supervisor. And then last but not least is to think about enabling every team member with systems and rituals and norms, cultural norms within the team. So every manager can think about creating an oasis of well-being for their team. So let me show you what this looks like. So this is Kira Lewis. She's a senior manager at Marriott. And not only is she taking those Zumba classes, she's teaching them. Great example of do. Or take Dr. Huma Abassi at Chevron. They have a great program called I'm Scheduled, where managers talk about the, how they've scheduled themselves for their preventative screenings. Or take Mike Clausen here, who is the fire battalion chief with the city of Sioux Falls. And he speaks. He asks questions, having gone through managers on the move, asks questions of his team members, things like, what are you thankful for? What motivates you? If you could go anywhere, where would it be? So he's engaging in conversations with his team members to promote emotional well-being within his team. Or take Mike Yurchuk after going through managers on the move. He now has a regular practice 
Every one-on-one -on -one meeting that he holds with his team members always begin with a walking meeting. And during that walking meeting, he's focusing on developing the relationship between him and his, and his team member. All great examples of do, speak, and create. And again, what every manager can do, every manager can create this oasis of well-being. And in doing so, they can create this little mini culture of well-being. And that, in turn, can create a ripple effect throughout the entire organization. So what we're seeing is that this program is having a positive impact not only on those managers who are participating in areas like engagement and productivity and well-being, but it's also creating a tr trickle-down um, positive effect on team members as well, where team members are also reporting higher levels of well-being and productivity and engagement with their work. All right, so to begin to bring this to a close. We often hear this idea about personal responsibility, about how we are all personally responsible for our health and well-being. And yes, we are, are we not? We all need to take personal responsibility for our health. However, I wonder, is there more to our health and well-being than taking personal responsibility, especially if we're thinking about the water that surrounds the fish. So when it comes to getting more physically active, is this only about personal responsibility, or is it perhaps about the neighborhoods that we have collectively designed that are better suited for our cars than they are for us getting physically active. Or if we think about healthy eating, think about the fact that our grocery stores are filled with these food-like substances and that are in turn are filled with Filled with sugar, salt, and fat. And of course, what's the first thing that we learned in school before we learned to read, before we learned to write, before we learned our ABCs? We learned to sit and be still, did we not? And the problem is that all of us have learned to do this far too well. So for years, your teachers have been telling you to settle down and sit still. You can stop now. And of course, what's usually the first thing that we say when somebody comes into our home or into our office? Have a seat. And of course, this has become fitness in America. <laughs> so collectively, we have created a massive biological cultural mismatch. We are biologically programmed to move, but we are culturally mandated to sit. We are biologically programmed to restore, but we are culturally mandated to always be on. We are biologically programmed to eat whole foods, but we are culturally and conveniently mandated to eat fast food we have created a biological cultural mismatch. So again, the importance of looking at the water that surrounds the fish. How can we enable personal responsibility by addressing the larger environment and the culture? So this brings us to our third point. If you want to address the water, the third thing that you can think about doing is to design nudges and cues. So nudges, you might say, are environmental prompts that make health and well-being easy. Think back to your organization. Is it easy to be well when you are at work? And an important question, I think, for all of us to ask ourselves, am I healthier because of my work? Or am I less healthy because of my work and where I work? The environment that I am in day in and day out when I go to work, is it easy to be well or is it a lot of work to be well? 
And then the second piece of this is cues, which are cultural norms. And so these are uh, what's considered normal. Is it normal in your workplace to get up and begin to stretch? Is it normal to do a little hula hoop? I don't know. Is it normal to eat healthy foods? Is it normal to take a 20-minute nap or a 10-minute nap? <laughs> okay. People are like, uh, OK. All right, so. So let me give you some examples of what this can look like. So this comes in the form of optimizing the stairs, for example, making the stairs accessible and attractive. It also comes in the form of something like what they're doing at Google, which is putting out smaller plates. So if you take out your grandmother's plates, are they not smaller than the plates that you have at home, perhaps? So just by doing this at Google, they've reduced caloric consumption by 30%. A nice little nudge. So something that you might think about at your next event. Or how about this? Nap pods. <laughs> Not surprisingly, this is at Huffington Post. So of course, Ariana Huffington, who famously speaks about the importance of sleep, uh, she now has the expression, uh, the importance of sleeping your way to the top. Ha, huh, get it? <laughs> so, so, so maybe you don't have fancy nap pods like this, but you can, also, you can still have a room which allows people some quiet time, for example. It doesn't have to be this fancy. Or what about this? At Facebook, they have a writing wall where people can share ideas and build community. Or at the United Way in Sioux Falls, South Dakota, one woman decided that she was going to start walking every day, twice a day, a mile each time. So she mapped out a route outside and a, and a route indoors, because it's cold, like it gets here. And then she persuaded her coworkers to join her on these walks. So this organization, they have been walking together as an organization twice a day, a mile each time, every day for 14 years. Isn't that awesome? That is a cue in this organization. This is just what you do. You walk together twice a day, every day, a mile each time. This is the power of thinking more about how do we build a culture in which health and well-being is normal. So remember, as we are reminded by Mad Men, remember when smoking was a way of life. So if we were back in that time, some of you would be probably, statistically speaking, uh, about 40% of you would be smoking right now. And then what happened in 1964? This is when the Surgeon General came out with the warning about the dangers of cigarette smoking. And that same year, Congress passed legislation to put a warning label on every one of the cigarette packs. So then this is when the health advocates, they got on board and they were like, OK, we'll use scary signs to get people to quit smoking. Well, that didn't really work. So then they were like, OK, we'll try humor to get people to quit smoking. But what really worked? What made the difference? Getting back to the power of designing nudges and cues. Getting back to the power of focusing more on the water as opposed to the fish. We simply made it harder to smoke, especially at work. So just by doing that, we have cut our smoking rates in half. This is a giant public health success story. Imagine if we cut fast food consumption in half. What an amazing public health success story that would be. So imagine if we're taking a designing nudges and cues kind of approach. Imagine if 
every chair, including the chairs that you're sitting on right now. Imagine if every one of them came with a warning label. This is the motion infusers warning. Getting out of your seat may cause happiness, great ideas, higher productivity, and a general sense of well-being. Imagine if we made it that much easier to bike to work. And imagine if we banned our office chairs. So we come back once again to that one person. What can I possibly do to make a difference? What I can do is I can focus on the water more than the fish. And I can do so by uncovering the hidden factors, by activating every leader, and especially managers, around those three domains of do, speak, and create. And I can think about designing nudges and cues. But I can also rest assured that my personal choices are, in fact, not so personal after all. Rather, every choice that I make, every healthy choice that I make, positively influences not only my friends, but my friends' friends, and even my friends' friends' friends. This is a well-documented phenomenon known as the social contagion effect, which means that our personal choices are, in fact, really community choices. And so what that means is that when I invest in my personal health and well-being, I am, in fact, this is one of the best things that I can do for my friends, for my families, for my coworkers, for my community, for my nation, and even for my world. So I urge each of you to go back and channel your inner superhero and go back and start a movement. Thank you all so much. It's really nice to be with you. <laughs> Appreciate it.